All right, well, we're gonna switch gears a little bit now. We're gonna go from financial and economic open borders to geographical open borders. If you all heard the Bosch talk earlier, I think it was he who said that the world once belonged to everyone before we created the construct of borders. So here to now unpack the case for open borders, uh, we have, first of all, Sloan Frost. So she will be the moderator for this. Sloan, please come on stage. She is the chairwoman and the director of Students for Liberty. This is a very big deal. Please come on stage and join us. And admittedly, we, uh, we just met in the restroom earlier. And you know that someone is an extraordinary woman because by the time you're done washing your hands, you basically want to hug them. That's how good our small talk was. Would you like to introduce the rest of the panel or would you like me to do that? All right. Well, we have Director of Immigration Studies at the Herbert A. Stiefel Center for Trade Policy Studies, Alex Narashti. We have Professor of Economics at George Mason University. We have Professor Brian Kaplan. Yes, give them some love, y'all. Associate Professor of Economics at Duquesne University, Anthony Davies. And of course, we have Sloan. Thank you. Hey there. For everyone else who wants to look really cool and or is high risk like me, we have these masks available for zero dollars at the SFL table. They say, don't tread on anyone. All righty. So thank you all for being here today. As I was saying uh, in the ladies' room, this is a very emotional day for me because it's the longest I've ever been not around fellow SFLers in like two and a half years, which is crazy. Um, so thank you guys all for being here, for making the trip, for watching, engaging us online. Uh, we're very excited to be welcoming you all today to this discussion. So my goal for this panel, because I think it's pretty obvious that not only are these three experts, but that they kind of are a little close to the same page, um, is not to trip you up. I'm not gonna throw you like a four seam fastball, but I'm also not gonna throw you a really crazy Great slider. We're at a baseball Thank stadium, you. I'm attempting. All right, so I know that everyone has different viewpoints. We're gonna try to understand them. And then at the end of the day, when you go back to your college campuses, your schools, hopefully you'll be armed with some more ideas that you can in turn engage with your fellow classmates and professors. So let's start with a definition of our topic today. How would you define open borders? Well, I did a debate for Intelligence Squared and the thesis was, or the resolution was, let anyone take a job anywhere. And I think that's a pretty good one. Uh, another one that I sometimes say is, it's the claim that unless you belong in jail, you should be free to, li to live and work anywhere you want. So that takes care of murderers, for example, but otherwise anybody else. So if you don't belong in jail, you should be free to live and work in any country on earth. Yeah, and... Uh... Yeah, I'd basically say if you're not a violent or property criminal, if you're not a national security threat and you don't have a very serious communicable disease that you could spread to other people, then there should be no rules, no government laws that uh, restrict your movement. You should be allowed to live, move, and eventually become uh, a citizen if you want to of uh, basically any place in the world. And in other words, uh, the presumption should be that anybody should be allowed to move wherever they want, and the government should have a very, very good reason to stop you, and it should be particular to you as an individual, that reason. Yeah, I don't have anything interesting to add to that. I think peaceful people should be free to come and go as they please. Excellent. Clearly there's resounding disagreement in the audience today. Um, so I'm going to try to uh, start with a few of the kind of academic or philosophical questions, then we'll get into a policy bait, then we'll end with a sort of a rapid fire, how would you debate with your friends questions. So to start off with, libertarians often talk about the distinction between a positive liberty and a negative liberty. So the freedom to have something versus the right not to have to do something. Um, so this has been applied to borders because some people will say that you have a right to the freedom of movement, but that doesn't mean that you have a right to come into this country. How do you think that applies to the take on open borders that you have? Yeah, so the idea that it is the right of a country to restrict access to the country is based on the socialist idea that countries are collectively owned by their citizens. I'd say if you think that, you should not be a libertarian. Like, really? 
Uh, so, you know, in the same way, you could say, well, like free trade does that mean the right of people from other countries to sell goods here when the people of this country don't want to, or don't want them to do so? Well, yeah, exactly. If most people in the country are opposed to Japanese cars coming, but some Americans want to buy Japanese cars, free trade means they can still buy them despite the majority view. And similarly, open borders means that even if some immigrants are unpopular and most people don't want to deal with them, that those of us who do want to deal with them are free to do so. Um, so that is my, my main view on that. Um, I mean, I, what, uh, yeah, so I'll just stop there. Yeah, borders are meant to restrain governments. They're not meant to restrain individuals. Borders are rules at jurisdictions between governments where they act in different places. I think it's totally legitimate for the government to try to stop the movement of other governments into the United States to take over things. Borders are lines in the sand to stop that. They're not supposed to stop peaceful individuals moving voluntarily to new opportunities and new places that uh, where people want to hire them. I mean, and, the, and, the, and then the opposite, right? The opposite side is, uh, and it's related to what Brian said, but every immigration restriction is a restriction on the right of native born Americans or people, natives in any country to deal with foreigners in the way that they want to individually. So every restriction on a foreigner, um, every restriction on a foreigner entering is a restriction on a native born person dealing with those individuals in the way that they want to. And we often forget that too. This is one of those questions that baffles me because if, if we are to accept that there are certain truths that are inalienable, uh, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, for a right like that to be inalienable means it is not bestowed by government. It applies to all humans everywhere regardless of nationality. And to argue that a government could step in and say, okay, you may not cross this border to me sounds a lot like the claim that at least liberty and happiness are not indeed inalienable at all, but they're somehow bestowed by government. And of course, the great danger there is that which is bestowed by government can be rescinded by that same government. Yeah, just, just one other thing on that. So occasionally I've been taunted on Twitter. Someone said, hey, if Brian really believes in open borders, then he should let all the immigrants in the world move into his house. And I wrote back and I said, you know, that's a great idea. I will charge rent, buy more houses, and soon be the richest man in the world. And the response was, no, 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 you have to let them in for free. Like, I never said anything about free. Like, all that open borders means is that you are, is that anyone on earth is free to rent a place for a willing landlord, free to take a job with a willing employer, free to shop with a, with a, with a willing merchant. And as you might have noticed, it is actually totally normal for landlords, merchants, and employers to be very opening to hiring people on Earth because they care about the money. And, and that's the nice response, Brian, so I commend you for that. My response is to say, you're going to let all the Border Patrol agents live in your house? Because <laughs> we all have to pay for them anyway. I, I hope that wouldn't violate the Third Amendment, but I, I like it. Um, it so, did not go viral. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, as much as we might agree with the arguments that you guys have made both today and in your previous appearances in writing, not all libertarians support open borders. Um, some have quoted Rothbard's Nations by Consent. In 1994, he changed his mind on all of his previous arguments, and he had said, well, if you have this privatized country, and I'm paraphrasing, if you have a privatized country, then everything is private, and you can't just let people in who might want to come into your country because they're encroaching on your private property. Do you think that argument holds any water? Well, what I'd say is if it starts off as totally your land, then you should be free to let people in or, in or out. The key mistake Rothbard is making is thinking of countries are the collective property of their citizens, which is, by the way, a, like a, a premise that he was never willing to follow to any other conclusion except on immigration. Right. So, again, if you really believe that countries are the property, the collective property of their citizens, then free trade goes away, too. If most people in the country don't think that people should be able to go and trade there, then it shouldn't be allowed. Freedom of religion goes out. If most people in a country don't want a religion there, then the religion shouldn't be there. So it really is an odd argument that I think he actually didn't, wasn't sincere on, right? And I did not say that lightly, right? What's particularly striking is back in 1980, Rothbard did write a critique of, I believe, Ed Clark's argument against open borders, where Ed Clark had said, well, as long as we have a welfare state, then we can't have open borders. And Rothbard back then in 1980 said, like, by this logic, then we can have motorcycle helmet laws until we get rid of socialized medicine. No, 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 no. We will not allow one act of government to become the justification for other acts of government. 
And then you think he really did drop the ball on this one, unfortunately. Ball has been dropped. All right. No, that was excellent. <laughs> and Mike has been dropped. All right. So um, in schools today, uh, many of the attendees here and probably some of you attending online as well, you go to a college campus, you think you're opening your mind to all sorts of ideas. Maybe, maybe not. Those cover the concept of open borders. You guys all have talked to students before. What do you think college campuses and college students aren't learning about open borders that they should be learning? So uh, I'll put it up. There's a slide deck that I have up there. If you can bring up the first slide, this is the thing that I wish college students and everybody else would learn. This is a highly simplified legal map of one small part of the U.S. immigration system. When I speak to people across the country, it's happened that I talk to audiences of Republicans in Arizona and college campuses. I used to get this, I get this question all the time. I say, they say, um, why don't the illegal immigrants just go down to the post office and register and become legal? What do they have to hide? And it's my sad duty to inform them that actually the borders are functionally closed. And what's remarkable in my mind is so few people actually think this. They think that there's some system like Ellis Island still open where it's very easy to come to the United States if you just follow a handful of rules and just explaining to them that no, that system was replaced with this monstrosity of a legal system where it's virtually impossible for the vast majority of people who wanna to come to this country to do so legally. So this is something that I wish college students knew, that every American knew, and I think it would be the number one thing that I'd wanna teach them because it frames the debate, right? When you talk to people, um, if it were really easy and simple for people to come here legally, and you saw 11, 12 million illegal immigrants, you would ask, well, what do they have to hide, right? That, that would be a legitimate question. Why can't they just get legal if it's so easy? And you have to sadly explain to them, well, there is no way for them to get legal. There is no way for them to come lawfully. It's been replaced with this mess. So this is the number one thing that I wanna teach people in the United States is that immigration by and large is illegal. And that's why we have the issues that we do today. Yeah, I, I want to underline this because I've, I've spoken to people who have gone through the process and I've heard these words before that we effectively have closed borders. It doesn't hit home until you talk to someone who's gone through the process that the cost just in terms of the lawyers and the paperwork and all of this, if you're lucky is in the tens of thousands of dollars. And again, if you're lucky is measured in years and by law, you're required to be here while this is going on and you can't have a job. I don't think there are any non-immigrants who could live up to those criteria, let alone someone who's come in from outside the country. Yep. What I say is that when I talk about this with students, I don't find them to be at all touchy about it. Most students are very receptive, but it basically goes in one year and out the next. And what I really want to tell them is this issue I just talked to you about open borders is much more important than all the issues you care about. All the issues that upset you, all the issues that people are sharing on social media are a rounding error by comparison, right? We really are talking about laws that say that most people on earth are not free to live or work in, in the first world, right? The, compared to the complaints that people have about the treatment of other groups, the treatment of foreigners or especially people that are born in the third world is vastly worse. Right. I have multiple papers saying look, you know, that immigration restrictions are much worse than Jim Crow laws. And I really do mean that. Like Jim Crow laws said that there are some restrictions on the kinds of jobs that blacks are allowed to have, some restrictions on where they're allowed to live. It does not compare to what we do to immigrants in the full light of day and in a way with very little actual sense of guilt. Right? So as to why it is that it is so hard for people to take it seriously, you know, Partly, it's just that most people are nationalists, whatever they call themselves. So when things that bad, when bad things happen to foreigners, they're like, well, they're just foreigners. What's the difference? Right. Uh, then again, another part of it's just sheer numeracy and just not realizing how big different magnitudes are. Right. So one of the main things that I teach when I do open borders is just to say, let's get an estimate of how much higher the production of humanity would be if everyone could take a job anywhere. Right? And the answer comes down to something like doubling the production of humanity, doubling the production of mankind if anyone could take a job anywhere. Right? And then if you say, all right, so how does that compare to the kinds of issues that people are worried about? It's like, it is many thousands of times larger than that. All right? And yet, 
generally people decide how much to care about an issue not based upon the numbers, but rather based upon the vividness of the examples. One YouTube video can change people's minds a lot more than a pile of statistics, right? And I find it my unfortunate duty to say, well, yeah, but the statistics are more important and actually count more. And it's important to calm down and think about what is really important rather than what actually is getting people upset. And, and to link that to sort of the previous question, right? Look at this chart and tell me what's libertarian about that. Tell me what's libertarian about these rules. And next slide, please. Because we hear nonsense from people all the time. The libertarian path to open borders is very easy. The libertarian path to close borders is a bunch of nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. So don't pay attention to that crap. I'm reading. I went to public school. It takes a while. Um, interesting. So going off of this, uh, this thread of um, what it was libertarian or not libertarian about that diagram and, and the lack of familiarity people have with that diagram, one notion that I've learned about quite a bit recently is the difference between people who are coming to seek asylum versus people who are not coming to seek asylum as immigrants. Do, is there a distinction in your thoughts between those two groups of people? And do you think that that has an implication for what our policy should be? Well, I, I think it's pretty clear that the people who are coming here and actually fleeing for a well-founded fear of persecution by governments in their countries or violence certainly face a larger cost of us not allowing them into the United States. They could lose their lives, their families could be killed, and that's, uh, that's terrible. But I also want to say that we didn't used to have these distinctions about asylum and refugee in American law. It used to be just people could come here. And in doing so, like in the late 19th century, uh, the population of, for instance, Jews in Eastern Europe who are fleeing pogroms, who are fleeing all the oppression from the Russian Empire and other uh, lovely nationalist governments in Eastern Europe coming to the United States, one to two percent of them would come per year. Now, they weren't classified as asylum seekers or refugees in the law because that didn't exist. But for all intents and purposes, most of them were. And that abruptly stopped in 1921 when the U.S. government closed borders. And then, you know, 20 years later, you had the Holocaust. So I always think about how many hundreds of thousands or millions of other people would have been able to get out of there and come to the United States, except for lack of an asylum law or just for keeping the borders open for a few decades longer than they would. But it's something where if we have free immigration, open borders, these distinctions between asylum and refugee doesn't really matter anymore. Uh, people will come to decide to, to what to do. But if, 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 you know, I had to have, you know, it, it's hard to think about this, but if I had to let some group of people in around the world, right, into the United States without restrictions, I could only have like open borders for one other country, I'd probably take a look at, okay, what country has a lot of people that's pretty poor and they're facing a lot of oppression, uh, you know, if I had to make that cal calculation. So probably something like China, I'm not sure. But um, so it, it, it's valuable but it's something that's solved by having free immigration. Great. And uh, to your comment, Brian, about the images, I think there was a lot of immediate reaction to some images we saw around Haitian migrants who were being brutally, inhumanely treated uh, at the border, and not to mention all the other images that, of which there are too many on the internet that you can find of people being treated inhumanely. I didn't even cue it up, but that's another example. The next, next photo. Um, yeah, um, one would think that an image like this would have an effect on our policy discussion, and yet it doesn't seem that we've moved the needle on our policy discussion. Why do you think that is, and do you think that that will change? Do you think these images will have an impact? I think the images have the opposite effect. So there's uh, some findings in political psychology where when people perceive chaos occurring someplace, my reaction when I see chaos is, well, the government policy is probably causing this. We should have some liberalization. Most people, when they see chaos, their reaction is to throw more police officers and more border walls and to crack down on that thing. And there's a lot of findings in political psychology across countries when there's more illegal immigration, more perception of chaos along the border or in other areas, people want to crack down. So although, you know, I see this image and my reaction is, why is there a border patrol agent who's a unionized government employee paid by the government? to uh, and taxpayers to uh, you know, harass people who haven't been accused of any kind of crime. 
Um, but the reaction of most people when they see something like this is there's chaos, it's out of control, we need to crack down and get control with this. And you see it with drugs, you see it with crime, you see it with all types of things. So unfortunately, I think things like this probably have the opposite effect um, amongst uh, normies. I mean, Alex may, may be right on that. I do think about the famous image of the dead Syrian boy, which seemed to be very important for increasing the number of Syrian refugees that were led into Europe. So, and again, this is one where I say that that one photograph had a lot more influence on the world than anything I've written. Um, and on the one hand, it's like, well, why? Why can't people just be reasonable about it? On the other hand, you know, people are emotional, and that's what, you, that's what seems to be something more effective. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely a range of images, right? You have the, uh, the dead child on one side uh, blocked from arriving, and then you have, you know, the, uh, the grown adult who's, you know, committing a, um, you know, a very minor misdemeanor by crossing a border without permission. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that that reaction is correct, right? When there were some images uh, famously of some, um, of a Central American man and his young daughter, I think she was two or three, who had died also crossing the Rio Grande, uh, that uh, got a lot of, you know, stirred a lot of hearts. And it's a horrible, horrible picture, right? I don't recommend looking at this stuff for very long. Um, but that got a lot of sympathy. But then people see this and they flip out. And they think that, you know, these guys are coming here to kill them or rape them or there's uh, chaos on the border. And people just, they don't generally like chaos. <laughs> yeah. I think the other part of this image that we usually don't talk about, though, and you started to mention, Alex, is the Border Patrol agent. And that there is also a human um, who is committing this act. And we may dehumanize them. Oftentimes, I think a lot of people who are pro-open borders will uh, say that every single Border Patrol agent is a negative thing. Um, but how do we humanize the people who are the ones carrying out the border enforcement? And how can we either increase our rhetoric around it or do more outreach so that the people who are the ones taking, or the people who are the ones putting in place and enacting or, or you know, making real these policies either can understand the extent of them or you know, have a better way to change. So that's a difficult question, but in the 1950s, the United States had a big problem with illegal immigration too. There are about 2 million or so Mexicans leaving the US illegally. And what happened is the Border Patrol, uh, in combination with Eisenhower, basically went on this giant campaign to say, we need more visas. We can only control illegal immigration by having a lot more visas. This created the so-called Bracero program. It decreased the number of illegal immigrants in the U.S. by 90%. They were able to get these visas to work lawfully. They could go back and forth. Border Patrol had a lot easier time. They didn't have to track people down like this. They could focus on a much smaller pool of people. They felt like they had control of things. They could take a policy victory, right, by legalizing the flow. Uh, but there's this sort of catch-22, I think, in immigration policy where you have this chaos, the only way to reliably solve the chaos is through liberalization, but you can't get liberalization until people think the chaos has been controlled. So what you really need is sort of some brave guy, like this, his name was General Swing, he was a World War II general who was put in charge of Border Patrol, he said, I'm gonna get as many visas as I possibly can for all the farmers in the Southwest so they don't have to hire Mexicans illegally, and Eisenhower was cool with that. So like, what are the odds that you get two like, politicians and generals uh, agreeing on something like that it doesn't happen very often. So, you know, I would try to convince Border Patrol agents of that, but I mean, good luck. Uh, I don't know how to do that. I've been working in policy for like 12 years. Yeah. I mean, I'd say this is a complicated issue in the following sense. Border Patrol agents are doing something very wrong. They should stop. They should quit their jobs. Like Joshua. <laughs> right? And I actually did persuade one such person to do so. So, so former border agent Joshua Childress, I believe, uh, he actually blurbed uh, my book, Open Borders. So he said he heard these arguments, and he said, yeah, they're convincing. I'm not going to do it anymore. Uh, I do think that uh, it is true that you are not going to change other people's minds by demonizing them, however bad they are, right? I think it's much better to focus on immigrants being good, even if it is, in fact, true that people carrying out the orders are doing a bad thing. Uh, that's the tough situation we're in. So, um, right. In general, I will say it is always a bad idea to make enemies, even if the people are doing something bad. Right. So, talking to people very nicely when they're doing something bad is unpleasant, but it is very important to be an ambassador for your viewpoint. And that is the way that you can improve things. 
So I'm a big fan of the classic book, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Right? Uh, it's one that libertarians need to read. I always tell libertarians when they say, how can we improve our arguments? So you go, our arguments are really good, about as good as arguments get. But people don't like us, and they're not wrong to dislike us. Right? We, have a, we, we have many bad attitudes. We don't talk to people very well. So rather than focusing on making the arguments better, I say it is better to focus on being friendlier to other people. In fact, to max it out, to become known as ultra-friendly. If people heard libertarians and their image was very much like Mormons, they're so nice, they're so kind, they're so wonderful. That's the best thing we could really do to make our cause more successful. There's one. It, and I'll say one good thing about Border Patrol agents. One good thing, they're the most corrupt federal law enforcement agency. And when the laws are really bad, corruption's a good thing. So thank you for that, Border Patrol. Not touching that. Okay. <laughs> so if we think about the image that you had projected actually first, Alex, and the general process of people who, or the general process that people are actually uh, legally taking to become an immigrant, what in that giant chaos would you say is one thing that could be changed tomorrow? Or what is the lowest hanging fruit of the numerous changes that you would like to do? You mean like what's politically... Like What's with, politically expedient? Um, well, right now, nothing, because nothing's going to happen. So I guess that's uh, by definition. But I think that the thing that's probably most popular right now, there are two things. Uh, one is uh, when it comes to the green card system, employment-based green cards, which are for highly skilled workers and their families, uh, 140000 a year, uh, there are per-country caps. So only 7% of these green cards can go to people from any one country in any year. So from India, 7%, from China, 7%, from Iceland, 7%. So as a result of this, the backlogs for people in India waiting for the employment-based green card category three is about 170 years. I mean, it's like something out of the Soviet Union, right? It's like a joke. So the good thing is you have a lot of these uh, Indian immigrants who are here, they're on H-1B visas, temporary work visas. You can adjust and get a green card from those who are, you know, they're well off, they're connected, they're highly skilled, uh, they're, they speak English as well as I do, and they are just banging the drum about this injustice where they have to wait, but they're never gonna get a green card because of this line. And so you have had bills, S-386 has been one of them where it passes the House, you know, it'll pass the House, H.R. 386, it'll pass the House like 410 to three and things like this. It's just everybody holds it up because they wanted to sweeten the rest of the immigration reform that other people don't like so much. Another thing that people are pretty positive about is legalizing the dreamers. You know, these are sort of young people who are brought here when they were young as illegal immigrants by their parents. They've basically grown up here. They speak English. They're as American as anybody else. Culturally, they're appealing. Uh, they know how to appeal to Americans using, you know, American tactics because they basically are. And almost every, most people want to uh, legalize them, like 70% of Republicans want to legalize them. Uh, we were really close in 2017 and 2018 to do this. They were going to do a bill, exchange a border wall for legalizing around 800,000 Dreamers. And the last minute, Trump said, oh, and you have to cut this green card category for family members. And that blew it all up because nobody would go along with that. So those are the two things that seem like the most likely in the near future. Pretty small potatoes, though. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that there is any low-hanging fruit here because you're, you're suffering from the classic seen and unseen problem that we can see the cost to immigrants coming in. They're going to take my job or they're going to, you know, be using public resources or whatever it is. And you don't see the unseen, which is that immigration itself is a filtration mechanism. I mean, think about what sort of person would leave a culture that they're familiar with for a culture that they're not? or language that they're familiar with for a language that they're not, for people that they're familiar with, friends and neighbors, to people who they aren't, all in the name of bettering their lives. Those are the attributes of entrepreneurs. And if you look at the numbers, it bears it out. Look at the either immigrants or children of immigrants. Amongst Fortune 500 companies, 40% of them were founded by either immigrants or children of immigrants. Amongst small businesses in the US, 20% of them were founded either by immigrants or children of immigrants. And if you go by the numbers, you end up with something like 50 million jobs in the US 
being directly attributable to either immigrants or the children of immigrants. They, they more than proportionally represent the creation of jobs in this country. And that's the unseen part. You don't see that when you talk about opening borders. What you do see is my job's going to be taken by somebody who's going to do it for cheaper. And I think that unseen part is the part we have to drill home. Yeah, so I hesitate to ever go against Alex on what's really going to happen in Washington. But here is at least something that sounds not crazy to me. If we were to go and just get rid of all COVID regulations at the federal level in one fell swoop and just say we are turning back the clock to the good old days before then, this would actually by stealth restore immigration to much higher levels because so much immigration was eliminated or prevented as a result of COVID. So if you just imagine it being a, a general uh, anti-COVID de anti deregulation uh, and then immigration just gets thrown into that general category without a lot of thoughts, that, in my mind, is the lowest hanging fruit. But maybe I'm wrong, Alex. Well, uh, yeah, so you're not wrong. Uh, the problem is the... So in, in March and April of 2020, President Trump ended processing of visas and green cards overseas as part of COVID. Uh, and he did it in his executive action to protect American jobs. So it's not... <laughs> it doesn't actually say for the disease purposes, it says it's funny to protect the American economy and all this stuff. So what happened was visa processing for green cards dropped by 90% and for non-immigrant visas it dropped by 93%. Now the Biden administration is slowly reopening that stuff as it is right now. And last month the green card processing overseas was up to uh, 40,000, which is about what it was prior to COVID. So that's a little, it's not there yet, but the problem is all the green cards that weren't issued in that time period because of the way the, the, the county works are gone uh, under American law. So you have to pass another law to get those green cards that are gone. So unless we do that, we're not going to get them back, and that's not going to happen. So we're getting back to that. The non-immigrant visa stuff is still pretty closed off. We're not back to where we were yet. Um, but, you know, eliminating a lot of these COVID stuff, that would certainly help, um, and that, that could happen. I mean, one of the corollaries, we wrote a piece about this, Basically, immigration law doesn't exist anymore. It's mainly up to the whims of the, of, the, of the executive branch to do whatever it wants. He has total control over who to allow in or not to allow in functionally. There's a law behind it, but the president does do whatever he wants, and we're dealing with that world right now. So. so it sounds like a lot of the changes that we had, be either because of COVID or ostensibly because of COVID, are things that maybe President Biden could be changing now, and he mentioned some that would be changing. It doesn't seem to me like he has changed quite a bit of things. Is there view on the horizon that a President Biden is going to change some of the things that President Trump did? He's like 80% Trump. So on this issue, maybe 90%. Uh, he, you know, I don't think Trump, I mean, I don't know. It's all counterfactual. Like, I don't know if Trump would have reopened the border as quickly as Biden has. And Biden has been dragging his feet like crazy. It's really inexcusable how long it took him. I mean, they, they wasted about 100,000 green cards this year, Biden did, uh, that aren't going to come back because of how long it took them to reopen the consulates for overseas processing. So, uh, you know, very rapidly, Biden could probably become the worst president um, if, 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 if these restrictions, uh, you know, maintain. Now, they're going away. Uh, they seem to be going away. Uh, but Biden is awful on immigration. I mean, he ran on a platform that was the best platform, pro-immigration platform of any major party candidate since 1864. Liberalizing immigration across the board, every category, great stuff just about for almost everybody. And he's done basically none of it. He, there is, I think it's the widest difference between what a politician says he's going to do and what he actually has done in office. Because Trump said he was going to cut legal immigration by two-thirds when he was running in 2016, and he exceeded those expectations. The difference between what he said he was going to do and he did was very small and in the right direction. Biden said he's going to liberalize. He hasn't done a damn thing, um, really, except for kind of reopen some consulates overseas later than he should have. So this is all very depressing. Um, what is yeah, politicians lie about stuff sometimes? That's it's shocking. It's brand new information. Um, what is something that we in this room 
uh, maybe not policymakers could do to either make marginal progress or get involved in the broader discussion about moving towards open borders? Stop perpetuating myths. And the you know, number one myth in my mind is that immigrants take jobs. And the data is very clear. They create far more jobs than they take. And many of the jobs they do take are jobs that Americans don't want anyway. That's myth number one. Myth number two is that they're net drains on our tax system. Immigrants spend, now I'm talking about non-documented immigrants, spend about $16 billion a year on state and local taxes. On payroll taxes, they pay about $18 billion a year. And notice something interesting here when it comes to federal taxes. They're paying into the system, but they will not receive Social Security benefits. They will not receive Medicare benefits. Actually, every non-documented worker that comes in extends the life of Social Security and Medicare because they're net contributors. Second, when it comes to federal income taxes, at the low end of the range, and by low end of the range, I mean like the bottom 60% of Americans are net recipients at the federal level. They receive more back in transfers than they pay in, in taxes. And here we have a situation where the immigrants are not, the non-documented immigrants are not showing up on the income tax roll. They're showing up at the payroll tax roll. They're not showing up at the income tax roll, which again is a net positive. So I think one of the, of the lowest hanging fruits when it comes to what we do is start poking holes in these myths. Yep. So this may seem self-serving, but uh, it's true. I think you should give kids my book, Open Borders, The Science and Ethics of Immigration. So, as you may know, it is a nonfiction graphic novel, and part of the reason why I did it, I mean, most of the reason why I did it is, look, we have all these ideas that are so, are so important, so cogent, and yet almost no one is ever going to read any of the articles that actually, that actually express the ideas. So I try to figure out what is a better way of introducing a larger audience to these ideas. Uh, all of my other books, I have tried to expand the audience, but I never really got to anything wider than the range from research professors to good undergraduates. And with Open Borders, I actually did. I actually did have my five-year-old reading over my shoulder. I know of a lot of families where kids were stealing their parents' book. So uh, I, you know, it is definitely the most persuasive thing I've ever written. And as you may have heard, young people are much more persuadable than older people. So um, I really would like to get copies of my book in the hands of as many young people in the world as possible. So if we could go to that slide again with the legal map. I mean, this is the number one myth that I would debunk is that the United States has pretty free and open immigration. And I think, especially in countries like the United States, Canada, Australia, other immigrant societies, we do have sort of a myth. You know, I think it's part of our values that we at least tell ourselves, right, that we're pro-immigration. Um, that's at least something that has appealed to people in the United States. The United States is not a nation state. It is not a state based on uh, ethnicity or tribe or blood or anything like that. Uh, we have this ethos where it's like our ancestors came from other places and that was pretty good. Isn't that something that makes us special? It's part of our culture. It's part of our myth. And a lot of people think it really hasn't changed that much. It's kind of surprising when you ask people um, about this. So if you can change people's minds about that, I think in this country and maybe in a few others, um, just knowing what the reality is legally and how impossible it is is probably the number one, the number one thing that I would express to people. Like when, when these dumb politicians say things like there's open borders right now and they talk about like 10,000 people apprehended by border patrol, I'm like, wait, there's border patrol apprehending people and the borders are open. What's going on is nonsense. I mean, there wouldn't be any border patrol if there were open borders. And just pushing people's minds uh, in that way, just to get them to understand what reality is right now, I think that's, you know, voters are dumb and ignorant mostly. Well, not dumb, right? They're ignorant. And they have a lot of silly things. Brian wrote an excellent book about this. And irrational. And irrational. Rationally ir irrational. Rationally irrational. Um, and so just, you know, if you just convince them with like, oh, this is the way that the world actually is right now, I think you can go pretty far. Yep. So I think I'm going to push back on that. So it is true that occasionally you have the very naive person who thinks that immigrants can just go and get permission at the post office. But 
most people, when you ask them, even now will say we should not have more immigrants. And, and, so, and, and if you ask them the distinction, what about more legal immigrants is more, more illegal? I have found actually most people do not think we should have more legal immigration either. Right. So, I mean, the, the way that I think, it, think about it is this. So it's a standard open borders talking point when someone says, oh, I'm against I'm just against illegal immigration. I say, yeah, well, I'm against it, too, because I don't think it should be illegal. And I have convinced exactly zero people with that argument. And you know why? Because when they say that they're against illegal immigration, they are also supporting the laws, making it illegal. It's not merely saying I don't like it when they break the law. They are saying that they think the law as it exists is either as limiting as should be or insufficiently limiting. So I get that question a lot, too. And I, I take a different tact. I always ask them, uh, how easy do you think it is to come here if you have a high school degree from Columbia and no family in the United States? And I, the answer I almost always get is, well, you just have to wait in line for a number of years. So I, I think they have no yeah. idea. Infinity is a number. What? Infinity is a number. Yeah, but they, they think it's like, oh, well, you know, they should just do what my ancestors did. I get that all the time. People should just wait until I let my answers. So I, I think you're over, I think for once, Brian, you are overestimating the knowledge of the typical American voter. <laughs> we could both be right. People are, ra people are rational enough just to hold incompatible beliefs, and they usually do. Is there a country that you think is doing it right? So the best countries for migration in the world are absolutely the Gulf monarchies. Absolutely. Right. Uh, if you just take a look at the foreign born share, you can see United, United Arab Emirates, 85 percent foreign born. All right. Does this mean it's perfect? No way. There's a lot of bad things that they do to, to immigrants there, but they let them in. Right. And it is not just bait and switch. It is not like you let them in and enslave them. Uh, rather, what's going on is that people are call, uh, who are in the Gulf monarchies are calling home and saying, I can think I can figure out a way to get you in here. We are making five times as much money as we would back home. We work here for 10 years. It's really tough. I'm not going to kid you, but when we go home, we'll be the richest men in the village. And that's what's going on in the Gulf monarchies. So in particular, they let in low-skilled immigrants to work. Almost no first world country does that. First world countries will sometimes let in low-skilled immigrants for family reunification or let them in as refugees. But to let them in just to get a job, that is something that is almost unthinkable in almost any first world country. And the Gulf monarchies do it, and it shows in their foreign-born percentage. It's really high, and again, it's not just petroleum engineers. They're letting in janitors and maids and other people who transform their lives by virtue of having this opportunity. After them, I say Singapore, right? So if someone says, what is the best democracy for immigration, then I will say Singapore. I also have a paper saying it is false that Singapore is a dictatorship. It is rather a democracy that has policies that are unpopular with Western political scientists, and so therefore they say it's not really democracy. But it is. International observers say Singapore is fair and free elections. Um, but if the, if the, it is true that the very open immigration policy in Singapore is not that popular. So, uh, but yeah, I'll say out of all the democracies, Singapore is the least bad. And the Gulf monarchies are the best overall on this one issue. <laughs> on this one issue. Not overall. They have lots of other bad stuff. But on this one issue, Gulf monarchies, awesome. I could, pick and I could pick and choose from a few places. So on low-skilled immigration, I take uh, the Gulf monarchies. On family immigration, I take the United States. And in terms of high-skilled immigration, I take Singapore. And in terms of immigration with your neighbors, I take any country in the EU. Yeah, and let me, let me give what sounds like a trite answer, but it's a serious answer. And that is Pennsylvania and Arizona do it really well. <laughs> you can move from... Arizona to Pennsylvania, and nobody thinks twice about it. And despite the fact that the culture in Arizona is much more similar to the culture in Mexico, the language, the economy, everything, than it is to Pennsylvania. We don't think twice about people moving from Arizona to Pennsylvania, but somehow we lose our minds when we draw a line on a map and say, well, people going across this line, that's something different. But notice we do the same thing with trade. You referred to this earlier. Somehow, my buying something from the store down the road, well, that's exchange. That's perfectly fine. But if you draw a national border between us, all of a sudden, oh, my God, this is something different. No, it's not. It's the same thing. All you've done is altered your perception of it in your mind. The reality hasn't changed. But, <laughs> yeah. It is worth pointing out there is one major U.S. state where they're getting a lot of people from other American states going there, and the natives are complaining about it a lot, and that is Texas. 
right? So in Texas, I when I, I spent three months during COVID there, you do spontaneously get a lot of people complaining, especially about Californians moving into Texas. I know there's actually very interesting work saying that overall, the citizen of the people that are born in Texas are in fact less Texan than people that are not born in Texas in Texas. People uh, on average move to Texas because they like it there, even though there are plenty of Californians who move there and then complain. It's actually, to your point, Anthony, also about state lines, it's true in Illinois, where I'm from, Chicago versus the rest of the state, even within the state of Illinois, it's like having two different states. And some people from downstate want us to see, which is always a fun debate. Okay, so we only have a few minutes left. And what I'd like to do is uh, pretend that you are having a debate with your either roommate or friend or peer or professor, and they throw an argument out against you that I'm going to very quickly say, and you have, let's say, less than 30 seconds to respond. So high notes. Um, what do you say to, but there's a pandemic right now and we don't want to let sick people in? So first of all, there is already so much COVID in America, it barely makes any difference whether you let in foreigners who have it. Yeah, so it, look, it really, there's a big difference between having a COVID-free country and letting one person that can affect the whole country versus having a country with 100,000 cases a day and then you make a big deal out of it, it's crazy, right? Uh, <laughs> Now, obviously, the other thing is there are obviously, obviously a much cheaper, humane way of dealing with the problem if it is real than saying you, that you can't come at all, which is saying you've got to be vaccinated or there's, or there's a quarantine or there's a test. Great. I can't top that. Great. All right. So the next potential argument you might hear is, but if we have open borders, then we can't stop people who are criminals who you said shouldn't be coming to this country. Don't we want to stop people who are violent criminals? On the contrary, we can stop them a lot better. If people, if anybody who's not a violent criminal or national security threat or sick can just go in through a port of entry after waving hi to a border patrol agent, then that means that people running through the desert probably actually do have something to hide and you can focus very scarce law enforcement resources on those folks. And by the numbers, Immigrants are incarcerated at one-fifth the rate of non-immigrants. So if your concern is crime, we should be deporting the non-immigrants. I love that. We have a debate in this country right now about a universal basic income and trying to guarantee that every human has some basic level of subsistence. If we let more people in, isn't that going to tighten the purse strings and try to make us even more poor? Yeah. The universal basic income is one of the worst ideas in the world. I, I have debated on this. Okay, for, would you say that to your friend? Yes. Uh, yes, absolutely. So, but I've got 30 seconds, so here it goes. If you were a billionaire and you had seven and a half billion dollars to give away, would you give a dollar to every person on earth? What a stupid idea. Right? Look, if you have finite resources, it makes sense to target the resources where they will do the most good, and the universal basic income just says, don't do that. Uh, the, uh, the astronomical cost of the universal basic income is something almost no one wants to deal with, but anyone who looks at the numbers will tell you, when you give money to everyone, either you give a very small amount per person or it breaks the bank. It's just a silly and childish idea. UBI makes Social Security look like a responsible program. And UBI, if, you're wanna, if you want to liberalize immigration, let people in, uh, UBI is a great way to convince more people to be opposed to immigration because then you're definitely going to be given welfare people as soon as they come over the border. Boy, it's a great, like, uh, you know, Ron Unz, who is this nativist in California who runs a place, he says he supports raising the minimum wage because it'll punish immigrants the most and force them out of the labor force. I wouldn't be surprised if he's also in favor of UBI because it's a great way to convince people that all these immigrants are freeloading losers who are coming here for welfare. So if you support that, you know, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah, all, all, <laughs> you, all UBI does is to spread around the stuff we've already produced. If you want people to live better lives, the answer is let's produce more. And how can we do that? So I give you, I give you an example, Apple, Google, Amazon, eBay, Intel, Tesla, Yahoo, Capital One, and Kohl's. Those nine companies were formed by either immigrants or children of immigrants. The total market value of those nine companies exceeds all of the income that we have paid to undocumented immigrants over the entire past decade. You want to produce more stuff? Let more immigrants in. 
And if you really want to help poor people, you don't give UBI to rich Americans. You let in more poor immigrants. All right, last rapid fire question. You libertarians, shouldn't you be opposed to a federal policy? Shouldn't states be able to make their own policies on immigration and whether or not individual states have open borders? This comes back to my first point, which is the question, is, is happiness, is liberty, are these things inalienable rights? If they are, no, you shouldn't leave it to the state, shouldn't, shouldn't leave it to the federal government either. These are inalienable rights. If they are alienable rights, then we should all be checking our pockets. I favor liberalization, and I don't care on what level of government it's on. Yeah. I will say that you know, if it were up to states, then you would just get more variation. And since we did not have hard borders within the U.S., it would really be a covert way of getting immigration liberalization. So basically, you would just have to find what is the easiest state to get into, and then you fly there, and then you move over to whatever state you want to go to. So that's, uh, you know, it, is a, it is a fine strategic idea, but it's not really a particularly relevant idea. We, uh, we actually wrote a bill for Senator Ron Johnson that he introduced in 2017 on this, and Representative Curtis reintroduced it in 2000, uh, early 2020 to create a state-based visa program modeled on Canada that has one. Um, so, I mean, it's better than nothing, <laughs> but it's not relevant. Brian's right. It's not really relevant. I would love to see that bill get debated on the floor. Um, all right, so we just have a minute left. What is your hottest take on open borders that you make, want to make sure people have heard or something that we haven't brought up that you want to make sure people walk away from this panel knowing? Yeah, we are sitting here in the richest country on the planet precisely because nobody stopped our parents and grandparents. If you're a nationalist, you should support open borders because it will make the United States a stronger and wealthier country. If you're an egalitarian and you want fairness around the world with all human beings, you should support open borders because it will increase that. If you're a uh, conservative, uh, immigrants tend to have a little bit more socially conservative values, especially when it comes to family formation. You should be in favor of open borders. If you're a progressive, you should be in favor of it because it increases uh, the prosperity and equality around the world. And if you're a libertarian, you have no reason to oppose open borders except a lot of nonsense that doesn't make any sense. I can't top that, Alex. That's great. All right. Thank you so much to our panelists, to all of you in the audience, and all of you joining us online. Let's keep this discussion going.